Good afternoon, uh, guys. Today we are going to go in a little different direction. As you know, we finished the unit yesterday on the Protestant Reformation. Today we're going to uh, talk about Baroque art. And uh, before we get into it, uh, well, the first thing, uh, later on I'm going to walk you through um, traveling to Rome with Rick Steves. But for that, let's look at some three specific pieces of art. Okay, let's look at David. Now, this is the stat Michelangelo's David. It is the most famous sculpture in the world, as we already know. And it comes from the higher Renaissance. This is a Renaissance statue. Okay, now, what is different between this statue and... This is, let's blow it up. This is Bernini's David. Uh, the artist, one of the most famous artists of the Baroque period was Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Should I remember that, Mr. Horton? Not really. Uh, it's just that he's a Baroque artist. This is his David. It is also carved from white marble. Uh, whereas David's, uh, Michelangelo's David was 14 foot tall. This one stands, I think, like five feet tall. But look how it's different again. Go back. That one, that's Michelangelo's David. This is Bernini's David. Michelangelo Bernini. So if you had to answer the question, what are the differences? Well, uh, obviously, here in Michelangelo's David, very staid. That's his sling over his shoulder. He actually has a rock in his right hand. You know, I never saw that before. I've been looking at this st statue for two decades, and I never noticed he had a rock in his right hand. Um, and this is Bernini's David. Uh, this, though, they're both doing the same thing. They're about ready to go into battle against Goliath. Uh, but this one, you see, David is coiled like a spring, and he's ready to let fly, uh, you see. And interesting note, this face is the face of Gian Lorenzo Bernini. You know, artist, what can I say? Um, so if, <clears throat> if Miss Jasper puts her own face on The Last Supper and Instead of 12 disciples, there are 13. I won't say a word. Uh, but anyway, yes, the Gian Lorenzo's uh, David. Now let's look at a couple more, okay? This is Sandro Botticelli. Sandro Botticelli was, he was a little earlier than Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, Donatello. But this is, once again, I've showed you this before. I know I did, so... Uh, this is the very famous subject matter of Judith and her Lafernese. The story where the uh, Jewish woman goes to this guy, her Lafernese, who is besieging the city of Jerusalem, gets him drunk, and then lops off his head. Now, you see, look, here is this artist, you know, portrayal of that story. You know, you look at, oh, you know. Uh, heads up there on the basket, and they're walking back to Jerusalem, feeling good about themselves. But now let's go to this one. This is the most famous depiction of that particular uh, incident. The uh, artist Artemisia Gentilici. And Artemisia Gentilici, like I told you before, was... Uh, a young girl who her father was an artist she wanted to be an artist you know and she but i mean during the 16th century women didn't do art you know it wasn't allowed well she kept after her father and he finally relented and apprenticed her to a master artist and that artist uh, raped her and yeah is some of that anger in this painting me, I'm saying, uh, yeah, 
And oh yeah, once again, another thing that kind of is a telltale, a tell of the uh, Baroque period, this, the black background. Yeah, I've actually could do a bunch more uh, pieces of art, but uh, why don't we have some fun today and go to Rick Steves. So Rick, what do you got for us? And there he is. Now, see, I'm, I'm making you watch this with me because I'm going to pause it and stop and talk. And uh, I'll get rather annoyed. So. This time, we're in a city that for centuries has been a magnet for world travelers. We're in eternally entertaining Rome. <laughs> I hope you can hear that. There it is. There's history everywhere here in the city of the Caesars. The Colosseum reminds us of ancient pageantry and gladiators. Monuments like Trajan's column. Boost yeah, this is, and I, I'm, I told you, I'm going to drive you nuts. This, that's Trajan's column. It is a hundred foot column that Trajan, uh, who was emperor of Rome in 117 AD, do you have to know this? No. But uh, it was a column that Trajan built, uh, 100 foot tall. And basically, the story that winds around it is the story of the Roman conquest, the final conquest of their longtime enemy, the Dacians of Eastern Europe. Uh, and what's interesting, though, is at the top of this column, which you may or may not get to see, later on, one of the uh, popes, the Roman Catholic Church, had his statue placed on top of it. Did imperial eagles. Statues show how emperors were worshipped as gods on earth. And the pantheon. Oh, yeah. My favorite skylight anywhere inspired future yeah. ages to great domes of their own. So we'll learn about these ancient wonders in another episode. That's right. Right now, we're interested in a different Rome. Busy with life Baroque. and bursting with Baroque. This is Baroque. This fountain is Baroque, decorative, you know, uh, the, you know, water coming out of various orifices. Uh, but yeah, it's Baroque. We'll ramble through the venerable heart of Rome, admire breathtaking oh, Marini yeah. statues, ponder sunbeams inside St. Peter's at the Vatican, and mingle with the Romans over an early evening stroll. Will eat really well. Yeah, see, I mean, that's one of the cool side benefits. You, you guys need to get hooked on Rick Steve as much as I am. Wherever he goes, he eats, and he talks about what he eats, and, you know, it's just cool. And go local after dark, lacing together the eternal city's most romantic What night. is the name of this fountain? Does anyone know? Anyone know? That you come there, and you go up there, and you flip a coin into the fountain, and it means that you one day you'll return to Rome. I didn't do that. I should have done that. This is the uh, Treveri Fountains, yes. Night spots. The old center of Rome best explored on foot, ideally in the spring or fall. For me, the most exhausting thing about traveling yeah. here is the heat of summer. Oh, yeah. We're here in the springtime. It's much more comfortable. While much of Rome is splendid and grandiose, it can be intimate as well. Regardless of your sightseeing agenda, getting out early lets you enjoy some of the world's great public spaces while they're just waking up. Early birds can Look even enjoy that. the generally packed pantheon nearly all to themselves. Yeah. A morning spent wandering is filled with surprises. Playful fountains decorate squares. Poke around, explore. In the back streets, it's clear. This city is a collection of real neighborhoods, artfully living well in a rustic and ancient shell. A 
As the rhythm of daily life hits its stride, the famous Spanish steps, today adorned with azaleas, fill with people. For over 200 years, romantics have gathered here to enjoy a little Dolce Vita with their sightseeing. And it remains a popular place to savor the joy of simply being in Rome. Scusi, signore, dove è il campo di fiori? Ah, grazie. Another colorful Roman gathering place is the Campo dei Fiori, literally the field of flowers. This has long been a fragrant and vibrant market. The market thrives in the morning. What's seasonal during your visit will be favored by local chefs and featured on their daily menus. We're here in May, and it's puntarella, asparagus, and artichokes. Whether you come for the produce or just for a stroll, Campo dei Fiori is one of Rome's most beloved public spaces. While Rome's streets and piazzas are busy with people, its countless churches are busy with art. Here we Pop go. into just about any church and you hardly know where to look. That's because they're decorated in the Baroque style. Baroque, okay, here we go, Rick. Tell them, Baroque. Every inch is slathered with ornamentation. Oh, wow, spiral columns, framing scenes that almost come to life. Cupids doing flip-flops. And ceilings opening up into the heavens. After the intellectual nature of the Renaissance, the role which followed was emotional. By the year 1500, Renaissance artists had mastered realism. Now, in 1600, Baroque went beyond realism to wow its viewers with exuberance. Baroque art was propaganda. It served the needs of the divine monarchs and of the church. Say, did you catch that? Baroque art was propaganda. I mean, it was a way of bringing people back into uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Pulling emotional strings, it convinced people to obey. Rome is the birthplace of the Baroque style. And Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Yeah, did... there he is. Gian Lorenzo Bernini. Bernini's David. I just showed you that. Didn't work here in the 17th century is considered its father. Seemingly insignificant churches like Santa Maria della Vittoria ah, come yes. with lavish interiors. And if you know where to look, important Baroque treasures hide out. Bring ah, here we go. Okay. This is this this is one of the side altars. Have you ever been into a big Catholic church, uh, a lot of them have little altars off to the side for private prayer, private masses to be held, those kind of things. And the money would be contributed by, you know, donors and things like that. And so this is an art piece that is composed of two parts. Number one, of course, is what we're going to look at here in a minute. And then there's these guys. They are contributors. And it looks like uh, what's going on here, they're watching, you see. Uh, that way the contributors are immortalized as well as what they are, you know, the primary focus, which was, this is called the Ecstasy of St. Teresa. And we'll get into, Rick's going to talk about this in a minute. So, yeah, interesting. Nini designed this side chapel like a theater with members of the family who paid for the art looking up from their box seats. The master Bernini invigorates reality with emotion. Center stage is the ecstasy of St. Teresa. Bernini captures the feeling. Okay, now. I hope they get a, we need a better look at this. Teresa described when the angel pierced her heart with a heavenly arrow. She said, the pain was so sharp that I cried aloud. But at the same time, I experienced such delight that I wished it would last forever. Okay. You see, once again, Baroque art was supposed to appeal to the emotions. St. Teresa is a venerated Catholic saint, a woman, uh, and she, here she's talking about the moment in time when the Spirit of God came into her. And it said it, it was painful, but at the same time, the greatest pleasure she ever felt, and she hoped it would last forever. I mean, it's hard to explain this. Basically, I mean, look at the woman's face. 
And it's what Bernini wanted to communicate to the people that looked upon it, that the spirit of God entering her, it looks like she's having an orgasm. And that's what, and that's also what Bernini intended. You know, don't go, let me turn and say an orgasm. No, it's what the artist intended. And, you know, that's what it was about. That's what Baroque was about, appealing to the emotion. You know, much more emotional. Uh, you have David, the stayed David and Michelangelo like this, and you have Bernini's David like, his, you know, like, you know what I'm saying here. Okay. Exploring Rome on foot, you alternate between peaceful back lanes and busy arterials. Towering high above the traffic stands Il Gesù, a leading church of the Jesuit order. It's another church. Ah, uh, did you hear him mention the word Jesuit? I talked about that yesterday. One of the orders, in fact, the most famous order of all Roman Catholics, the Jesuits, founded by Saint Ignatius of Loyola with his most famous missionary, Sir Saint Francis Xavier. Rated to the hilt in the Baroque style. Take Saint a moment. Baroque. Put yourself in the mindset of a 17th century churchgoer. Marvel at the splendor. Once again, this art carried a message. The Catholic Church, threatened by Luther and the Reformation movement, was striking back. Here, this symbol of virtue beats down Protestants. I see. These are Protestants. <laughs> and, of course, they're getting whooped on by the righteous Catholics. A determined cherub rips pages from a Protestant book. Yeah. And the angel struggles with the evil serpent of heresy. Yeah. See? Propaganda. But see, this appeals to the emotion. You have a cherub ripping a, uh, this book, and you know this righteous angel is stomping on Protestantism. Show them. Yeah. It appeals to the emotion. Today in Rome, the visitor struggle is more likely out on the street with modern traffic. But the notorious Roman traffic is being tamed. Like cities all over Europe, more and more of its old center has become traffic-free and pedestrian-friendly. Still, watch out for the scooters. Watch out for the pickpockets. After years of searching out my favorite European restaurants, I found a few universal indicators for a great eating value. And a place like this has them all. The best eateries are little family-run places that cater to locals. This one's open weekday lunches only. At a glance, you know this place is really fine. Limited selection, handwritten menu in one language. Packed with the neighborhood gang. Each day there's a special. Today is spaghetti carbonara. Simple, tasty cucina casalinga. That's home cooking, Roman style. For a breezy escape from the big city noise and intensity, head for the Borghese Gardens, Rome's Central Park. Romans are proud of their generous green spaces. This sprawling park has long offered people here a place to relax, unwind, and let the kids run wild. The park's centerpiece is the Borghese Gallery. Once a cardinal's lavish mansion, today it welcomes the public. As is the case with many of Europe's top sites, Admission requires a reservation. Getting one's easy. Just a quick phone call or visit the website and you get an entry type. Good guidebooks have all the details. Baroque. The wealthy Borghese family filled their 17th century villa with art. This was the age when the rich and powerful not only collected beautiful art, but actually employed leading artists to spit up their homes. Cardinal Borghese was the Pope's nephew and one of the wealthiest people in Rome. With unlimited money, his palace dazzled with both fine art of the past, such as Raphael... You see, that's not Baroque. Uh, I can tell that's not Baroque. ...exquisite deposition. And with the best art of the day. Yeah. Each room has a masterpiece at its center. Like this intriguing look at Napoleon's sister, Pauline, by Canova. The polished marble is lifelike. Not Baroque. Even sensuous. 
There it is. That, yeah. Burmese David is textbook Baroque. Bursting with life, David's body, wound like a spring and lips pursed as he prepares to slay the giant, shows the determination of the age. Bernini was just 25 when he sculpted this, and the face of David is his. See, now this one, I see it broke, 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 and that, he's about to tell you, that is David, uh, David having uh, defeated Goliath, and that is Caravaggio, the painter. He put his own face in there. Caravaggio tackled the same topic on canvas. Grabbing an opportunity to shock his viewers, the artist Caravaggio also sneaks in a self-portrait, this time as the head of Goliath. In keeping with the Baroque age, Bernini's rape of Persephone packs an emotional punch. Persephone's entire body seems to scream for help as Pluto drags his catch into the underworld. His three-headed dog howls triumphantly. Bernini's Apollo chasing Daphne is a high. Now this one, I want you to look at this one, okay? Now this is Apollo, this is Daphne, and Apollo's trying to get with Daphne, and uh, Daphne is a trickster, and as Apollo grabs her, she turns into a tree. See that? That's a tree. You look up at her fingers, they turn into leaves, and Apollo is like, eh. Uh, but anyway, what amazes me more is this simple thing. This is one piece of marble. And look at all the little fine, you know, pieces that he had to... Uh, carve in, out of marble in here. I mean, some of them were wafer-like, and you know, how do you keep it from breaking off? Uh, it just amazes me. Right. Apollo, happily wounded by Cupid's arrow, chases Daphne, who is saved by turning into a tree. See? See the leaves on her fingers? In typical Baroque style, Bernini captures the instant when, just as Apollo is about to catch Daphne, her fingers turn to leaves. Sorry, Apollo. Her toes sprout roots, and Apollo is in for one rude surprise. Come on, Apollo. The statue, as much air as stone, makes a supernatural event seem real. Yeah. This yeah. classical scene, while plenty fleshy, comes with a church pleasing moral. Chasing earthly pleasures leads only to frustration. But Apollo, yo, the place to contemplate that yes. is it. This is Saint Peter's Basilica. This is what all that indulgence money got spent on. And yes, I've been in here. And I mean, this. See, look how tiny the people are up there. This, you know. It is the most beautiful man-made thing I've ever seen in my life. I hope to go back one day. That the Vatican. Here's a case where crossing a street is crossing a border. I just left Italy. Vatican City may be the world's smallest independent country with just a thousand inhabitants, but it's the spiritual capital of hundreds of millions of Roman Catholics. The Vatican is built upon the memory and grave of the first Pope, St. Peter. Its centerpiece St. Peter's Basilica. Even though the Vatican City occupies less than a square mile, this country has its own radio station, newspaper, post office, and a cute little train station. Along with the grandest church on earth, it has a massive museum. The Vatican is ruled both politically and religiously by the Pope. The Vatican City is embedded in the city of Rome. It's surrounded by a mighty medieval wall that evokes a less than peaceful history. After the fall of Rome in the 5th century, the city of Rome eventually came under control of the Pope. In fact, for centuries, the Pope was called the King Pope. And little by little, the King Pope established his own empire. At its peak in the 1600s, these papal states, as they were called, encompassed much of the Italian peninsula. When the modern nation of Italy unified in the late 1800s, it absorbed most of the papal states, including the city of Rome. But the Pope held out. For 60 years, the Pope was holed up here, behind the Vatican walls. Finally, in 1929, 
the Pope and Mussolini signed an Lateran Treaty, establishing the Vatican. Yeah, of all the people to make peace with the Roman Catholic Church, Benito Mussolini, right? As its own nation. The garden-like core of the country, where serious administration takes place, is closed to the public. The Vatican military is made up of the Swiss, Swiss Guards, and they still wear the same outfits from the Midi Middle Ages. Swiss Guard. In 1506, the Pope imported mercenaries from Switzerland, who were known for their loyalty and their courage. Today, about 100 Swiss soldiers clad in their flamboyant Renaissance-style uniforms still protect the Pope keep the crush of visitors as orderly as possible, and patiently answer tourists' questions. Piazza San Pietro sits on what was the site of an ancient Roman racetrack. Imagine chariots making their hairpin turns around that obelisk. For added entertainment during the games, Christians were executed here. In about 65 AD, the Apostle Peter was crucified within sight of this obelisk. Peter's friends buried him in a nearby graveyard on what pagan Romans called the Vatican Hill. For 250 years, Christians worshipped quietly at his tomb. Then, in 313 AD, Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity and changed the course of history. A basilica was built here, and this became the head of the Roman Catholic Church. 1,200 years later, the original St. Peter's was replaced by this most glorious church in Christendom. Upon entering, your first impression is, it's huge. Oh, yeah. And like he's about to tell you, he said he's lost entire tour groups in here. I mean, you, this picture doesn't do it justice. You are, it's like you're in this ginormous place, this cavernous place. And this, by the way, see this thing here? This is Bernini's altarpiece. It's made of gilded bronze. It stands 100 feet tall. Notice that 100 feet tall is nowhere near the roof. 600 feet long, bathed in sunbeams. It can accommodate thousands of worshipers. The ornamental cherubs dwarf a large man. As a tour guide, I've lost it. Remember room. that in the end, it is a church. You cannot go in there and wear a hat, and uh, you must wear long pants. If you are a female, you have to wear a dress. Um, in here. Visitors marvel at grand paintings decorating the many chapels, but they're not paintings at all. Because oil on canvas would soon be covered by... They're mosaics. What is a mosaic? A mosaic is a picture made up of thousands of little pieces of either glass or marble or something like that. The candle said, you won't find actual paintings in St. Peter's. Just the magnificent work of the Vatican School of Mosaics, with thousands of different colors in their Transfiguration by Raphael. This scene showing Peter looking after early Christians while centuries old looks almost new. Michelangelo's Pieta is adored by pilgrims ah. and tourists alike. Here, the 25 year old Michelangelo makes the theological. The Pieta. Yeah, the Pieta, remember? Not Baroque, it's Renaissance. Message very clear. Jesus, once alive but now dead, gave his life for our salvation. The contrast provided by Mary's rough robe makes his body, even though carved in hard marble, feel soft and believable. The high altar, like so much of the art decorating the Vatican, is another masterpiece by Bernini, with sunlight illuminating its alabaster window, as if powering the Holy Spirit it encrusts the legendary throne of St. Peter with a starburst of Baroque praise. Baroque. See, that's Baroque. See all direct. And here is Bernini's altarpiece. This guy, Bernini's altarpiece. Directly above the altar, which marks the tomb of St. Peter, stands Bernini's bronze canopy, and above that, Michelangelo's dome, taller than a football field on end. The inscription declares, in Latin, to S. Petrus. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. This is the scriptural basis for the primacy of Rome in the Catholic Church. A viewing purge gives travelers a close-up look at those huge letters and a heavenly perspective into the church. From the rooftop, you can size up the dome you're about to climb. 
For a close-up look at Michelangelo's dome within a dome design, climb 300 steps to the cupola. Uh. The view from the top is unrivaled, both of Rome in general and of the Vatican grounds. You can survey the entire country from this perch. The long rectangular building is the Vatican Museum with the adjacent Sistine Chapel. Perhaps the richest collection of Western art anywhere. Absolutely. Over the centuries, the popes have amassed enough art to fill 11 miles of museum hallways. Yes. Sumptuously decorated with precious tapestries, dramatic frescoes, and ancient statues. The museum features art from every age. Its exquisite painting gallery includes Raphael's much-loved Transfiguration. Halls and courtyards are littered with ancient Greek and Roman masterpieces. Like the Laocoon, so inspirational to the great masters of the Renaissance. And the Pope's apartments tell Christian history. This is the battle in which Emperor Constantine was led by angels and a holy cross, both to a key military victory and to his own religious conversion. And these rooms celebrate pre-Christian philosophy. School of Athens. Raphael. Here, Raphael paints the School of Athens, a who's who of ancient Greek intellectual heroes. Many he painted with the features of Renaissance greats, Leonardo, Michelangelo, and a self-portrait of Raphael himself. Of course, there's much more as we've just scratched the surface of this vast collection. If you're pondering eternity, try covering the Vatican Museum thoroughly. Busy and big as Rome is, getting around. You know, I tell you, I still remember that when I was in Rome, I hated it. I did not like the Italians. I did not like people trying to pickpocket me. I thought the city was dirty and the people, the Italians were mean. And I want to go back because there's just too much stuff to see. It is relatively easy. If your time's limited, catching a cab can be a good budget tip. It's sweat free and it's the quickest way from point to point. Especially for a small group, it can be a fine value. And from the window of the cab, we enjoy another lively look at the city. I find Roman cabbies generally honest, but still, count your change. <laughs> In Rome, you simply round up whatever's on the meter. Daisy. Sounds classic. In 1870, Rome became the capital of a newly united modern state of Italy. Shortly after that, the thunderous Victor Emmanuel monument was built to honor Italy's first king. That Victor Emmanuel, you'll learn that name one day. King Victor Emmanuel the second. It's him on the huge horse. The monument, built to stoke the spirit of a new and struggling nation, harkens back to the glories of ancient Rome. In fact, if you want to envision ancient Rome in its pomposity today, imagine a vast city made of buildings like this. The square fronting it is where, in the 1930s, Mussolini whipped up Italy's nationalistic fervor, ultimately sending a generation of Italian men off to a catastrophic war. And to this day, here on the national altar, burns the eternal flame. Remember? Yeah, you know, Mussolini, when he was eight years old, he got thrown out of school. You know why? He kept stabbing his classmates with a knife. And I, the school was like, you know, they... Took a <laughs> He's eight years old. Bring Italy's unknown soldier. Riding the elevator to the top of the monument, we enjoy a sweeping view of the Eternal City. Many locals love this perch because from here, they can see nearly all of their beloved Rome. Another towering Egyptian obelisk dramatically marks Piazza del Popolo. This is the starting point of a ritual in Rome, the evening stroll, or passeggiata. We're meeting my friend and Roman tour guide, Francesca Caruso, to join in the fun. <laughs> Let's go for a walk, I think. Yes. As the sun goes down, the people come out. Downtown Rome's main... I was there wearing jackets because I'm telling you, in the summertime, Rome is hot and humid. Street. And they don't have air conditioning. Via del Corso is pedestrianized and strollers just love it. It offers some of the best people watching anywhere. I think it's in the end. 
what I really like about the Italian way of life, and I can really enjoy it here in Rome, is the fact that all I have to do is step outside and I'm surrounded by people. I never feel lonely. I always feel connected with a sense of community. I think the Vasajak is a wonderful way of living the city. Uh, this is just sort of an inclination, early evening, cool of the day. Oh yes, you just go outside, meet your friends, have a gelato and a aperitivo, just enjoy the city. Who, who, who's wearing oh yes, yeah. that always. You know how the Italians are so aware of themselves and they like to be looked at and they like to look at each other. For many, the evening stroll leads to a nice dinner out. We're dropping by Ristorante da Fortunato. What you I enjoy a range of restaurants. Occasionally, I'll splurge in a restaurant like this, where you can let the meal unfold in all its many layers. First, antipasti. Mozzarella, prosciutto, arugula with shrimp, and artichokes, the last of the season. And a wine recommendation, a nice red from Piedmont. Then pasta, arrabbiata. There's no hurry. When Europeans go out for dinner, it's generally the event of the evening. While pricey, it's fun, once in a while at least, to enjoy a full-blown fine dinner on the road. The food keeps on coming. Mushrooms, right in season and really flavorful. Beef, rare and tender with a light gravy. And finally, blueberries and gelato. This is one splurge I'll never forget. After dark, Rome takes on yet another personality, and a short walk laces together its top night spots. Back at Campo di Fiori, the artichokes and tomatoes are packed away, and the social street lamps are turned on. These characteristic ladies, even late at night, feel safe and friendly. The nearby Piazza Navona is a carnival 365 nights a year. While this oblong square got its shape from a long-gone ancient stadium, today the games are limited to browsing and flirting around its famous Bernini Fountain. Just down the street is the floodlit Pantheon. It looms high above our 21st century, as if aching to tell its story, 2,000 years of Roman history. And at the same time, it provides a venerable backdrop for alfresco diners. There's too much light in the streets to go home yet. The Trevi Fountain is close by. This bubbly Baroque avalanche, dating from the 1700s, seems purpose-built for today's Roman embrace of life. With history, art, and people perpetually partying under the stars, it's no wonder people come here in droves for the promise that a coin tossed over the shoulder will assure their return to this eternal city. That may sound silly, but every year I go through the ritual, and it works. But we're not done yet. The final stop on our nighttime walk is back where we started, at the ever-popular Spanish Sticks. It's been the hangout of countless romantics over the years, and I hope someday soon that includes you. Rome, of course it's the city of Caesars, Popes, and Pleasant Mountains, but for over three million people, it's also simply home. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rick Steve. Until next time, keep on traveling. Ciao. Ciao. I'm Rick Steve. Until next time. <laughs> Simon's the hardest work to producer to tell us look at him right now. See he's working, he's thinking. Grumpy Fountain, look at this. Yeah, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> Rick Steve has a fan club. I mean, he really does. Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, so, give me that.